Hello and welcome. Uh, it's very good to have you here as we open up today's session and invite you all in to join us uh, to learn more about this upcoming program here at Columbia Business School Executive Education. This program is entitled VC Decision Making Online Developing an Investment Thesis. Um, we're going to take you through this informational webinar here today uh, where we're going to touch on two key areas about this program. Uh, firstly, what is the program content? So what is that curriculum? What can you expect to learn from week, week to week? What are you going to be able to take away from this program? The second thing we're going to be covering here today is how is that learning delivered? So what is that learning experience like? What is that tactical day-to-day -day component of being a participant in this course? Uh, we're going to take you through both of these areas as we learn all about this program. So we are joined here by today's uh, subject matter expert and, um, and keynote speaker of the day here to tell us all about this program with Andy Savarverman, who's the program leader at Emeritus. Um, Andy, thank you for being here with us today. Uh, would you like to jump in and say hello to our audience? Thank you so much, Marie, and uh, a warm welcome to everybody who's uh, either dialed in or is going to be watching this uh, session thereafter. But uh, I come to the program from Emeritus with a lot of experience in having led Emeritus programs before, and specifically for this particular uh, program, I have a background in not only being uh, the president of a startup company that's looked at uh, venture capital from the other side of the table, but I'm also a partner in a venture capital firm which focuses on investments in HR tech companies. So. I've seen the experience from both sides of the table, both as a VC investor, as also a president of a startup company that's looking for VC funding. So very cool to be part of this program. Uh, thank you, Andy, for being here with us and for sharing your knowledge and your expertise uh, throughout our time here in the session. Uh, certainly a lot in store as we hear from today's keynote subject matter expert about this topic, about this program, and how it's going to help you uh, to do the same as you look to explore these themes as well. Um, so a lot in store. I'm going to hand over that spotlight here more fully in just a moment. Um, but we did want to introduce more members of the team here to you today. This course is brought together um, by a whole uh, uh, many different uh, uh, folks, many different experts um, have gone into uh, the design and development of this program. Uh, first and foremost, your program faculty here, Angela Lee. She's professor of professional practice and finance and the faculty director. Of, of the Eugene Lang Entrepreneurship Center at Columbia Business School. So certainly very pleased to have uh, Professor Lee at the helm of our curriculum, who's designed this program uh, to, uh, to be delivered to all of you um, um, from around the globe. So uh, she's an award-winning professor here, former chief innovation officer at Columbia Business School, uh, where she teaches venture capital and leadership programs. Um, she started her career in product management and then moved to consulting at McKinsey. She founded four startups and is also the founder of 37 Angels, an investing network that has evaluated over 20,000 companies and invested in over 90 companies. Um, she serves as a venture partner at Fresco Capital, an early stage venture fund that focuses on the future of work, digital health, and sustainability. All of these themes have been brought in here to this program as well. So as you think about this, um, this, uh, this background um, industry expertise here, uh, these are the kinds of themes that we're gonna be touching on throughout our time in the program. So if you're interested in any of these areas here, um, whether it be consulting, startups, um, many different uh, touch points here in venture capital um, that will be, uh, that will be brought to light here throughout the program. Uh, you can see here that Professor Lee was awarded the Dean's Award for Teaching. So in addition to her wealth of experience here in industry. Um, she also um, is geared towards teaching and learning. How do I convey these ideas and these thoughts um, in, a, in a curriculum such as this one here? So um, as you think about this program and, uh, you know, sort of the, the designer of the program here, uh, Professor Lee has a special lens that she's looking at through um, uh, related to teaching and scholarship globally. So uh, this is what you can expect here in the program. Uh, she's spoken at the White House um, and NASA. She's an expert in teaching online and making learning scalable. You'll see that here today. Um, she's a sought after expert on CNBC, Bloomberg and many others. World's recognized, many of you know her name. Uh, so certainly happy to have her at the helm. She is joined by guest speakers throughout her time here. Um, Elliot Robinson and Hillary Gosher, two guest speakers who uh, talk about their, their specific niche areas of interest. Um, we have Elliot Robinson, who's a partner of Growth Equity. 
Hillary Gosher is a managing director at Insight Partners, um, sort of, uh, you know, bringing in their expertise as well to help round out your experience. And um, so as you think of the various layers of teaching and learning that are happening throughout your time in this program, you have your program leaders, you're going to hear from here today, uh, guest speakers, faculty, um, many, many different relationships. Um, as you think about your time in this program, you're going to be gaining insights um, not only from these key leaders, but from one another as well. Um, Columbia Business School prides itself um, on advancing education across the globe through a cross-disciplinary lens to business education. A big part of doing that and doing that well is ensuring that you have the opportunity to learn from one another, uh, to learn from your course faculty, your program leaders, guest speakers, and your peers. Um, and so that is how this program is designed. You can see here on your screen, Columbia Business School really is set apart um, from, uh, from other universities who are doing business education. And one of the things that sets um, Columbia apart here is the proximity to, to New York City, uh, the world uh, headquarters, if you will, of, of business. Um, so as you think about bringing these concepts into a place of real-time application, into a place of life, um, that proximal uh, location there um, certainly helps Columbia Business School education do just that, um, take this practition um, and really bring it out um, into the world. So that's what this course is designed to help you to do, to take that cross-disciplinary lens um, and to also apply your learning in a place of real world action. So we're gonna be doing that throughout the program here. Um, certainly I wanted to take a, a, just a quick second here on the second paragraph here on the slide uh, to introduce you to the alumni um, uh, crowd that you'll be joining here. Uh, you can see a very illustrious group of alumni, um, more than 50,000 across across 123 countries annually, um, 85 Nobel Prize winners, five founding fathers of the US, four United States presidents, 29 Academy Award winners. Um, so as you think about this broader community that you're joining, uh, this is the ecosystem that you're joining here. Columbia Business School is really at the helm of your learning, uh, the alumni, um, this you know, tradition and the proximity to New York City, um, all being folded into the ways in which this course was designed uh, to help you bring your learning to life. Um, so with that, um, who is this program in particular designed for? Well, this is really um, an advanced level program. It's got no prere prerequisites. So you can take this program uh, right, uh, it can be your very first program here at Columbia Business Business School Executive Education, um, but really it's designed for folks who do have a little bit more experience at mid-career and above um, venture capital professionals. Um, so you should be interested in exploring the evolution of the venture capital landscape and identifying emerging startup trends and technologies to invest in. This program is going to help you to do that. Um, so some of the representative roles are listed here, venture partner, portfolio manager, um, but really anybody who's interested in doing this is going to um, be able to benefit from here from this program. Uh, we know that creating your own uh, VC strategy um, uh, has a, a huge exponential opportunity for growth. Um, while the peak for venture capital in terms of dollar value is passed in the face of the global economic shutdown, the field continues to be one of the tremendous opportunity um, if you know where to find it. And so this program is aimed at helping you to do just that to thrive in this volatile environment uh, you really have to stay ahead of the trends and develop a solid investment thesis um, to help you to navigate uncertainty and pinpoint those opportunities. Um, this program is gonna help you to do that. Uh, you can see some of the stats here, 62% of all venture capital deals are early stage deals, 132 billion invested in financial services in 2021, um, which is 169% year over year growth and 21% of total venture funding. Um, so as you're thinking about the relevancy of this topic, as you're thinking about your ability to, to jump in and really have an impact here, um, it is, uh, there's never been a better time uh, to really be investing in uh, learning more about investment, venture capital strategy um, and creating your investment strategy. Um, so with that, I am now gonna hand over the spotlight to the expert of the day, the person who knows all about uh, the program specifics and all about uh, the curriculum here. Um, Andy, thanks again for being here. I'm gonna go ahead and hand that spotlight over to you now for next steps. Thank you so much, Maria. And that was a, uh a lot of content that you could pack in in the last uh, seven or 10 minutes or, but uh, that's what's the beauty of this particular space. Um, never a better time to be in uh, a venture capital because uh, uh, while you didn't make a mention of the fact that uh, the volume of deals or the uh, amount of uh, fund flow has kind of decreased uh, year over year based on the market situation at this point of time, it still is a huge market opportunity. 
if you can find the right deals, if you can find the right investment opportunities. And that's what this whole program is about, that even in the worst of times, there are a lot of opportunities to be kind of selected, handpicked, and zeroed in on. And if you look back at uh, previous times, you know whether it was the dot-com burst or whether it was the financial uh, crisis meltdown, there was a lot of companies that uh, were hyped up, that was uh, overcapitalized, or that was uh, not the right investment strategy that people learned from those mistakes. And we are, here we are in another situation where there is a correction that's going on in the marketplace, but it doesn't mean that a lot of the companies that have seen a scale back in their valuation are not good companies or not good ideas to invest in. But what does happen is that when investment flow slows down, that's a great learning opportunity to figure out, is there too much of cash chasing lots of ideas that may be good ideas, but not financially viable or tenable ideas. And this is where uh, the shakeout happens about the companies that are really built for the long term and for the future and what of, which of them are not for the long haul. And specifically this program talks about the ideas that are really investable. And for anybody who's out there, you know, whether you're a early stage venture capital investor, whether you're mid career, whether you're looking at uh, angel investing, seed A, round one, round two, and so on. This program is something that you can have a lot of takeaways from. And uh, I, like, like it was mentioned uh, before, if you look at the investing investment opportunity at this point of time, in the last six months, the whole financial services world has kind of turned topsy-turvy. From a time where everybody thought that the market is going to scale to new highs, suddenly there was a meltdown. And within three months, again, it seems to have flattened out. And probably regardless of a recession or an inflation, there seems to be more upside coming in. So while there was a pause in investment activity, all VC companies are kind of really looking at the companies that they be believe will be the right investment opportunities for them. And like I mentioned before, from my own personal background, I am part of both sides of the table. I am part of a small startup SaaS product company focused on the automotive vertical. And at, at a point of time when the market had collapsed, the automotive industry was struggling. We saw a scale back in investments, right? But at the same time, now is the time where we see a lot of companies kind of looking at us very seriously trying to see whether we would be willing to take venture investment. Those are the kind of options that are there for companies on one side. On the other hand, I'm an investor in very focused HR tech companies. And there are lots and lots of HR tech companies that are out there. And in the portfolio of companies that we hold, there are a few companies that have really hit it out of the park where the valuation are now five times, eight times, 10 times our investment. And then there are some wherein we don't think those companies are gonna make it. And really, when I look at even this program, I wish I'd done this program sometime back so that some of the investments that my VC firm did, probably we would have not done it if we had known some more from what are our takeaways from this particular program itself. So with that intro, let's move on to the first slide, uh, Murray. So here are the key takeaways that you can expect to learn at the end of the six weeks uh, that this program is about. What is the best way to determine the investment strategy for your venture capital firm and for your portfolio? And there, are, and there is a difference between the two. Your firm might itself be investing in a broad range of industries and in a broad range of domains, but you specifically might be investing within a particular portfolio of companies, even within the domain. And what I mean by that is that, say, for example, you're really focused on HR tech, okay? But within HR tech, there are different subdomains that might be there. And while your firm itself might be on HR tech or might be on say technology investing, you particularly might be focused on a portfolio of companies that are say more crypto or more uh, to do around cloud-based technologies and so on. So it, the first part of the takeaway from this program is that how do you determine what's the best investment strategy for your portfolio, whether you're operating at your personal investor level or at your firm level itself. The second is, to establish a criteria for the industries and the business models that you invest in. And what we mean here is that within the industries itself, okay, you might choose to decide that uh, each industry, whether you talk energy, whether you talk healthcare, whether you talk technology or financial services firms, there are lots of subdomains within that industry. And you need expertise within your firm to be able to really evaluate what's out there and what is really investable because it is so domain specific, it is so, so much of uh, subject matter expertise that is required that you really cannot research and decide 
all the subverticals within even a particular vertical to make really sound investment decisions on. Number two, what are the kind of business models that your chosen subvertical within your industry is? Is it that you're going to be targeting? Uh, and the business models make a lot of difference because there are some business models that are currently seemingly broken. Would you invest in those, knowing what you know at this point of time? The third thing is understanding the risk and return trade-offs between investing in the different stages. And this is what we mean by, are you at the angel investing stage? Is it uh, seed A, seed B, and so on? To determine at what point of time does your firm feel comfortable making an entry? There are some companies that are really at stage A, and they want to kind of invest before anybody else has invested in. And there are some firms whose philosophy is that they don't want to take that risk very early in the game because before the company has kind of proven itself in terms of track record, traction, revenue momentum, and so on. And they would rather be a later stage investor. And that's the decision that you need to be able to make at this point of time. And then recognizing and navigating trends that are transforming the venture capital market and uncovering upcoming opportunities. For example, you know, there are lots of venture capital firms that uh, went head in first three years ago, four years ago, five years ago, and invested a lot of their cash in say crypto or probably in cloud-based services. It also depends upon the timing of your investment. Knowing what you know today might be uh, something that can help you in making those investment decisions and your investment thesis itself, because it's not as if making investments in cloud-based companies is a mistake. They may have all pulled back 50%, 60%, 80% at this point of time because of the market. And for you to understand what is the right valuation and what's the right entry point into these kind of companies becomes a big decision point because that makes a difference between is your investment going to give you a return on investment or have you bought at the top and it's just a very, very expensive investment that you now need to write down. Buddy, can we move to the next slide, please? So like I said, there are six modules that go over six weeks and each module kind of feeds into the other and it's a great segue to learn on to what the next module will unfold for you. The first module is itself kind of really, uh, many of you may not uh, need it if you're already in venture capital, the, the, you're in the midpoint of your careers, have been doing a lot of investment in venture capital, but guess what? There is a lot of surprise to even those who have been doing it for a living for a fair amount of time in the sense that while we have got into this profession, while we are doing venture and capital investment, a lot of the lessons learned from the past of how venture capital originated, you know, identifying the key players, who are the big players in the industry. And that doesn't mean that they are the only ones that are relevant. Who are the ones that are really experts in a very niche area of a particular domain? Which are the ones that really have kind of done a lot of stuff even around the edges? Which are the companies that are not only investing in companies, but also supporting those companies from a growth perspective. They have mentorship programs, they have insights into those companies and so on. I think it's very important to identify who the venture capital players are, not only the top 10, not only the top 20, but by domain, by industry, by the kind of investments they have done in helping their companies get off the ground. I think that's a very important uh, area to kind of discover. The second is to explore the different stages of venture capital funding. Okay. There are investment theses and philosophies of some companies, even in the VC space, that decide that they only want to kind of invest in pure startups, not in the subsequent seed round uh, fundraising and so on. They would rather leave that to later stage venture capital companies to so explore what is the difference between early stage and the subsequent stage and subsequent rounds of uh, fundraising is an important criteria for you to understand what happens. How does valuation of the companies kind of keep on getting uh, higher and at what point of time is your company going to be very comfortable in making those investments and for you yourself as an investor as managing a portfolio what kind of portfolio would you like to build for yourself and the third point here navigating the venture capital deal flow process itself and this is important this is a segue from the previous point of exploring the different stages in the venture capital deal flow process itself as you kind of go through different phases and different iterations you need to be able to navigate with the companies that you're investing in and the kind of fundraising that they are doing with subsequent stages of uh, uh, capital raise. And how do you make sure that whether you want to be part of the subsequent investment phases or 
you have invested in the early stage, but you decide that the later stage fundraising is at a very high valuation and you want to sit it out because you, know, you have decided that your money is better spent in other investments rather, rather than in, uh, further investments in the company that you invested in prior. And then analyzing the key factors that investors consider before investing in a startup. And this is something really, really important. And obviously there are some very uh, standard factors that you look at, the founders, the track record of the founders, how much of uh, uh, subject matter experts, expertise do they have in that particular industry? What's been their track record? Have they been serial uh, in founders? Uh, what kind of uh, run rate do they have? What kind of cash burn rate do they have? These are all very important uh, reasons to kind of decide to invest before you go in uh, uh, you know, fully. And if you remember back in the dot-com days, there were a lot of companies that, where the idea seemed really, really cool. But if you remember Webvan or pets.com, chances are either they were poor investments at that point of time, or they were very, very early for the times that they were in. Very similar companies got funded and got exponential growth and were really great invest return on investments to their investors 20 years later. But back in 2000, probably they were not the right investments to make. Can we go on to module two, uh, Marie? The second one is how to choose your investment strategy. And like you can see from what I covered in module one, it really flows module to module. In the second module, we get to learn a little more insights into what are the most common startup investment strategies. You know, most of the times in a startup company, there is not much to kind of really go by. Unlike in a private equity investment where the company is well established, the company has got some amount of traction, some amount of history. And even when you look at their war room or their data room, there's a lot of uh, quarters and results to kind of really dive into and dig into to decide how's the firm been performing. But a lot of uh, startup insights uh, that you need is really based on very limited information. The company may have been around for just a few months, maybe a few quarters, and there's very little activities to go by uh, to kind of make a decision on. But what insights are the, the most common startup investing strategies is something very easy to kind of look at is what this course kind of helps you understand. And how do you compare and contrast these various strategies? And while there are different strategies, not all of them may be applicable to all the firms that you're evaluating. So how do you compare and contrast the different investment strategies that you can really look at to kind of get an insight? Is this the kind of startup that you want to invest in? Or would you want to kind of uh, give it a pass? Or do you want to wait for a future round by which time this company has got a little more to show in terms of their growth, in terms of their revenue run rate, their margins, if at all there's any, or their cash burn? All of those are very important things to understand. And then we go on to the third point, the different strategies that impact diversification, operational involvement, and the fee structure. And what this really means is, uh, let's assume that you're investing only in the technology space and your portfolio is completely built up of all uh, cloud-based startup companies. It depends upon the philosophy of the venture capital firm that you are in and what kind of risk reward that you want to even assume for yourself. Because this is the classical case of, do you want to have all your eggs in one basket? If you, if you have everything in say FinTech or in crypto or in cloud-based strategies, you are probably not well diversified. Maybe you're still diversified because the kind of areas of say even cloud or crypto is diverse. It's not, not all into say one space of only blockchain or only some cloud-based strategies and so on. And you might want to kind of rethink and decide how, what, much, what kind of diversification helps you with your risk mitigation strategies and how much of operational involvement will your firm need to have in managing these firms? Because uh, in some companies that are startup, you might need a lot more operational involvement as a subject matter expert and as the investor in that firm to make sure that with the founders and with the board, you have a fair amount of say, a fair amount of involvement to make sure that they, their capital is well deployed and that they're doing all the right things, uh, save a, a, a structural or a complete market uh, change that might happen. And the kind of fee structures that you want to have uh, for the investments that you make in. So this is a very important module to kind of decide what are the kind of insights that you have for the companies that you invest in? How do you compare and contrast to strategies? And most important, are you diversified? What kind of operational involvement will you uh, need to kind of provide to the firms that you invest in? 
and what is really going to be the fee structure. There are some standard fee structures, but it's again, all subject to negotiation, negotiation based on what is your leverage in kind of providing the investment to the firm that you are investing in and how many companies are you competing with, competing with to make the investment happen there. Mari, can we move to the third module? This is the heart of uh, this particular program. How do you develop an investment thesis? You know, based on what you would have covered in module one and module two, you identify, you learn to identify the components of an investment thesis in this particular module itself. You develop uh, the criteria to pinpoint what are the attractive in industries and the business models for venture capital investment. Again, this goes back to what is the guiding philosophy of your firm? What has your firm decided which industries, industries are you going to be, which business segments within that industry, and what kind of business models will you even go after? For example, just take energy as a, as a segment. If energy is the vertical or the domain that you're going to be investing in, even in ener energy, there are lots of different sub-verticals. There's upstream, there is midstream, and there is downstream. Which of those segments are you actually going to be investing in? And even within those segments, each of those companies can have a completely different business model that they apply, okay? And all of those uh, permutations and combinations can make a difference in the kind of investment capital that is required and the kind of thesis that you develop as to where you will invest in. Then you evaluate a real world investment thesis in the sense that there may be companies that uh, they're promising you that you know they are the next best thing that has happened. And they might be, but you really need to have uh, an uh, founders and startup uh, uh, folks are extremely passionate about what they do and they need to be really believing in what they're doing and they're giving it, the, it their all. There is no backdoor exit option for them and this is what is going to be make or break. And the passion with which they come in has to be tempered with the capital that you as a firm and you as an investor is going to invest in. And here is where you kind of develop a real world investment thesis by evaluating, is this real? Is this sustainable? Is this comparable to what is out there? What do their competitors offer? What is so different about them? And is this going to be sustainable? Is this going to be scalable? And is it going to be giving you the X times return on investment that you're seeking? Then you kind of really determine other factors that should inform your investment thesis. And this could be very, very different depending upon the industry that you're focused on and uh, uh, factors that you think in your broader macro opinion might come back to bite. For example, if this is a uh, investment that is going to take a lot of uh, runway, it is going to take a lot of uh, dollars before you see a return on that investment, it is going to make, uh, mean that there's going to be a huge amount of cash burn before things take off. It is a multi-year kind of a program uh, that they need and they require need a very high capital investment and they probably need some big backers. When you look at all of those things in the market where there's inflation, where there's a likely recession, and where the interest rates are going to go up, you might pause and decide, is this a good time for this kind of a company unless they have real solid backing? Uh, an example could be, they're going to make the next best aircraft engine, okay? It's a very high capital investment, but these guys are really cool, they're very savvy, they have some brilliant ideas, their PhD thesis was around that, and if they have Boeing and NASA and Lockheed Martin already investing in them. Now you believe that yes, this is a probably a good investment to make because they have clients that are signed up who are investing in that idea. But if they don't have those kind of customers and if they're if it's a very large capital investment and it's not that there's a very low barrier to entry into that space, you might look at those kind of factors to decide is this the right investment thesis for my particular firm at this point of time. Let's go to module four. So the module four is about constructing and managing a portfolio. Now, when you look at not an individual company that you're investing in a, a, a particular startup itself, but you are looking at an overall portfolio of companies, either at your VC firm level or even at your individual portfolio level. As an investor, you probably have invested in seven, 10, 20, 25 companies. And now you're looking at what is the risk that is there across the portfolio of companies that I have with me at this point of time. And venture capital, by very definition, is high risk because these are all great ideas. These are all startup companies. And of all the companies that 
are brought to uh, uh, that, that raise investment either at the angel investment level or self-funded or uh, seed A, seed B and so on. Many of them are great ideas, but don't make it because they're not financially viable. And when you build a basket or a portfolio of uh, companies, you have to identify the different decisions that you need to make when managing a portfolio. And at some points of time, you might decide that I want to exit because the valuation is kind of rich or the valuation is uh, sufficient enough for me to make the, the, the return that I was wanting to make on this investment because I want to invest in other companies that are probably looking much more likely to grow much more profitable for me at this point of time. And at any point of time, the decisions that you need to make to manage your portfolio is very, very critical. Along with that, within your portfolio or at the VC firm level, if you are a $100 million portfolio, you're not going to invest all that $100 million at one go because you always need to maintain a reserve within a fund because some of them will perform poorly, some of them will lose money, some of them will make X times the return and you want to hold on to them because you think that they are going to become even bigger and give you even more return on investment. So you need to calculate the reserves that you always need to maintain within a firm. And this is something probably you as an investor, you as a VC investor needs to know. Though you might have a CFO, you might have financial advisors who will help you with that. But at all points of time, the ability to ask the right questions is completely dependent upon you knowing at least the basics of what is the reserve that is required in a fund and how much of reserves is the right amount of reserve for you based on your risk reward uh, appetites. And then again, you compare and contrast the methods used to mark up a portfolio. And this works both ways. You mark up a portfolio based on what you see as the growth within the portfolio. And sometimes you need to mark down a portfolio because those funds are performing poorly. And the classic example uh, right now in the news is about SoftBank. SoftBank raised more than $100 billion in their Vision Fund 1 and a little less than that in Vision Fund 2. And because in the recent past, they went very aggressive and they kind of made, I think, 150 investments in uh, startup companies uh, in the last uh, 365 days. And a lot of them are performing extremely poorly. And what they reported recently is that in the last quarter, they lost about $21 billion and they had to mark down a lot of their investments because a lot of their portfolio companies are performing poorly. You hope that it's the opposite, that uh, a lot of your portfolio companies are performing so well that you have to mark up the portfolio to what you believe is a market value for them at this point of time. Can you go to the next slide, please? The next uh, module. So the module five is about navigating the changing trends in venture capital. This is super important because at all points of time, you have to have a macro view on what is happening in the world globally and in the countries that you are in and in the kind of economies that you are in because what might apply to say the United States currently may obviously not apply in Ukraine today, may not uh, apply to China the day after tomorrow or to India uh, in another quarter and so on. So you need to be able to have a framework to adapt to uncertainty and change. And the classic situation is that at any given point of time, a black swan event like COVID can happen at, uh, to the portfolio of companies that you are in, which is why the preceding module talks about always maintaining a reserve in your fund. And the other thing is to be able to dynamically uh, have a framework that you can adopt and re respond to changes that are happening in the marketplace. Likewise, developing a system to stay up to date on technology trends and determine where to add value because things change dynamically and the future of work and the future of technology with you know, innovation and disruption is going to be causing huge changes to the kind of business models and the kind of technology that a lot of your investing companies, portfolio companies are having today. And the ability to kind of know what the technology trends are helps you in making your decisions on investment in future companies as also kind of intervening operationally and providing insights and inputs to your founders and to the boards of the companies that you have been investing in so that they can course correct and kind of pivot to where the industry and the market is heading in the future. So that we come to the last module, module six. And this is, uh, you know, the previous module is a segue into the final module, which is how is venture capital changing to identify the key changes in the industry and differentiate between structural shifts and cyclical trends. And that's a great uh, way of ending uh, this entire uh, program. 
if you look at what's going on in the marketplace today, you have to ask yourself the question, with the kind of meltdown that's happened in the market, with the kind of uh, 30%, 20%, 50% reduction in the valuation of companies or even in publicly traded companies where some companies have seen their price, uh, stock price drop by 60 to 70%. Is this a cyclical trend or is this a structural shift? And understanding that helps you decide, are you going to be making a knee jerk reaction to what's going on in the market? Or are you going to be kind of sitting it out and riding out that storm? If you believe that what's happening in the market today is just a cyclical uh, trend and that, that cycle in the uh, lifetime of markets will change in the next three months, six months, nine months, when inflation recedes, when uh, the threat of uh, recession goes out and your companies are going to be performing better again, you might sit tight and you might ride it out. But if you believe that there's a structural shift that has happened and a lot of the companies that are highly valued today are not likely to be able to make it and they probably are companies that you may not want to invest in or you might want to exit. Those are the kind of things that you will learn in this final module. So uh, this is a great program for all the profiles that uh, Mari uh, talked about earlier. Whether you are an early stage investor, whether you are at the midpoint of your career, whether you are a CFO who wants to know more about venture capital, I think this is a terrific program for anybody who's in finance or who's, who's raising capital or is running a company to understand how does this work when you're dealing with and looking at either venture capital or from the VC standpoint, when you're looking at all kinds of companies, either a startup or an early stage company that you're looking to invest in. So with that, I'll hand it back to Marie. Thank you uh, so much, Andy, uh, for being here with us and taking us through uh, the module content here. And we're going to pivot over for a few seconds uh, or a few minutes here to talk about the learning experience. So now that you have that understanding of those overarching learning objectives, what we're going to be marching through from week to week um, and what those um, key takeaways are, uh, we're, we're now going to step into this space of talking a little bit more about the tactical experience of being a program participant. And I know Andy is a program leader, so um, I'll invite you in uh, here in just a moment, Andy, to talk about uh, what that role is here in the program and how uh, you work particularly with students um, in a role as a program leader. Um, but just to give you that kind of high level uh, vantage point here, um, this program was designed uh, to flex around your needs um, and to also be highly relational. Uh, so we want you to be able to come into this program, build relationships, interact with your peers, interact with your program leaders, faculty, guest speakers, and others uh, to really gain the full scope here not only um, in terms of your learning, but in terms of those relational components that are going to help you to drive success as well. So as you're working through problems, as you're working through challenges, as you're working through your learning here in this program, um, working with a, a diverse uh, set of colleagues and peers is going to give you that broadened scope of understanding, that tapestry of ideas. You're going to see these themes and concepts and frameworks come to life for you as you develop your thesis, as you develop your strategic roadmap. Um, and in learning shoulder to shoulder, with your peers who represent all different geographies, all different years of uh, professional experience, professional levels, uh, many different industries and job sectors and functions are represented by the peers in your cohort. Um, so all of those perspectives, uh, you're going to be able to um, participate in this reciprocal learning environment. So you're going to be bringing in uh, your perspectives, your expertise, your industry knowledge, um, your geographic location, all of that's coming into this program. And as you learn your way through these six modules, you're going to have, again, that broadened scope of understanding as you learn shoulder to shoulder uh, with your peers in the program. So the program is built around two ideas here. Uh, number one, when you think about the program experience, it's highly convenient. And we'll talk about how it's convenient. Uh, the second piece is it's highly interactive. Uh, so we know, especially in adult education and executive education programs like this, um, being able to be the driver of your own learning experience, being able to interact with peers, being able to bring these themes and concepts out um, in discussion, this is gonna add a lot of value to your learning. So we have a highly interactive program, a highly convenient program. And what that looks like in real terms is a blend of synchronous learning and asynchronous learning. So asynchronous learning, meaning uh, that you have an opportunity to touch in on the themes and concepts around a schedule that works for you. So we start out with week zero. That's an entire orientation week uh, where you get to know the platform. You get to know your peers and colleagues. Um, you'll design a profile for yourself, get to know the course schedule, and really get prepared uh, to dive in. 
Then you have that six weeks of intensive learning. At the top of each week, a set of content is released and you and your peers will have an entire seven days to make your way through that content around a schedule that works for you. So you're going to be learning in cadence with your peers, but still with a high level of convenience, being able to design your own schedule. These activities include on-demand videos. You can watch these again and again. These are brief five to seven minute video segments that outline the concepts that help you to dive into these core methodologies. And then you'll step away from those videos and you'll have role play exercises, discussion boards, um, you know, hands-on activities, knowledge checks, simulations, all of this aimed at helping you to bring the knowledge that you've learned into a place of real world action. This is happening asynchronous. So you'll watch those on-demand videos again, as many times as you need to again and again, as you step through some of these activities and discussions aimed at really helping you to bring your learning to life. And you're doing that in cadence with your peers. So you'll do that at the top of each week, that new set of module content will be released for you to make your way through across these six weeks. Um, the synchronous components, there are live webinars such as this one here um, available throughout your time in the program, live sessions led by faculty where you can get your questions answered. There are live office hours, a chance for you to turn on your audio, your visual, and engage in real-time discussion with your program leaders, your peers, and your faculty. These synchronous learning opportunities are all recorded, just like today's session. They're posted in the platform, and you're able to access them on demand throughout the rest of your time in the program. So even if you miss an office hour or a faculty webinar, you'll be able to come in the next day and have that simulated experience and catch up on anything you've missed. So again, highly convenient, even the simulated or sort of the synchronous learning opportunities, um, we're recording those and making them available for you. Um, not only do you have access to this program for that intensive six weeks, but you'll have access for an entire 365 days. So you have week zero to orient. You've got those seven or those six weeks of intense sort of learning with your peers and with your program leader and faculty, and then access to the course material and everything that's been provided here for an entire year. So as you're continuing to bring these themes out, um, you can touch back in, reach out to your colleagues and continue your learning for that entire year. The, the pedagogical approach that that we uh, that we'd like to describe here is called bite sized learning and it's really extending beyond the reach of what's possible in a traditional classroom where you have a certain number of seats in the room certain number of minutes to get through a certain set of content. Um, here in the online world, we break down those barriers of space and time, and we're able to deliver content to you in an on-demand fashion so that you can watch um, these brief segments of video clips and then step away and fully immerse yourself in the learning, in the activities, go back and watch the videos and have that fully immersive learn as you go around a schedule that works for you, educational experience. So. This program has been thoughtfully designed uh, by a team of experts, and we're so glad to have you here. We hope you'll join us. Uh, the learning experience really is uh, second to none here. Um, so I'd love to invite Andy back in. So the learning experience, probably I'd say the, the chief uh, uh, highlight is the program leader role. And the program leader, you're an industry expert. Um, and, and if I can just kind of frame this up for you a little bit, if you think of the various circles of teaching and learning, you have Columbia Business School, this kind of larger ecosystem, you have your course faculty at the helm of your curriculum with guest speakers, you have your peers who are helping to strengthen and enhance your learning, and then you have your program leaders, these industry experts at the helm of that day-to-day -day experience. Um, Andy, would you like to jump in and talk a little bit more about the role of a program leader and what you do in the course? Yes, and before that, Marie, uh, all the other things that you said about the program, uh, the way the program is designed, the way the program is delivered, the outstanding faculty, the pedagogy of the program, those are all great points and which is what makes this program extremely unique as compared to any other online learning content itself because uh, you have a great faculty you've got some excellent uh, guest speakers who come in and the way the program flows as also the fact that uh, it's kind of bite-sized as you said it's also very self-paced and you can keep going back and relearning things that you found very interesting or you thought you needed to dig down a little more and so on and unlike any other online program, unlike any other uh, executive edge program, which is uh, uh, you know, uh, not in person, the really cool thing about this program is that you have a dedicated person, like the program leader who's there for you. And the, the program leader is accessible at any given point of time. You can email your program leader. They will respond back to your questions, your concerns, and so on. And they do host a weekly live office hour. 
And what happens in that office hour is it goes over an hour. A lot of people join in despite it can, it can be any part of the world, right? It's normally scheduled at a time, which is kind of convenient to most people. And we have seen people from Australia, from China, from India, from the US, all logging in, they dial in, and they have an opportunity to discuss the previous week's session with the program leader. So if they have a question, if they have a concern, if they want to debate, if they want to chat about it, the program leader guides that discussion and they make it more about the participants. It's not like a lecture. It's more like a discussion that is facilitated by the program leader. So they, they do come prepared for the session. They have a few slides, which is really the takeaway or the learning from the module of the week that just went by. And they kind of engage the participants in breakout sessions in kind of some discussions so that there's a lot of learning and a lot of uh, re reiteration of what they felt or what they wanted to talk about. Uh, and it makes it a lot more engaging. So apart from the fact that the cohort or the participants can kind of engage on the Canvas platform, which is where this whole course is uh, uh, hosted. Uh, you, are, you have the ability to kind of uh, chat with each other. There are assignments that you work on. You can comment on each other's assignments and so on offline. But this is an opportunity to be online in real time, talking to each other, networking, creating those relationships for the future, as also talking to your program leader. Um, so like I said, this one is very, very unique. I think this is the only program that has a dedicated program leader for the cohort and the participants to live interact, to ask questions, to uh, form some relationships and create networks, not only through this program, but also for the future. So really cool. Absolutely. And I'll just echo that, you know, immediately upon entering this program, you're broadening your professional network, you're gaining peers and colleagues from across the globe, you're gaining insights from uh, your program leaders and faculty throughout your time in the program. The other thing, the other big return on your investment, if you will, um, is a chance to earn a credential here from Columbia Business School. As many of you know, this course does culminate in a chance for you to formalize your training and earn a certificate of completion. Um, and for any one of you who's, who's looking to really springboard into career advancement opportunities, um, certainly having this credential credential, this formal uh, credential here from Columbia Business School Executive Education. Uh, this is going to go a long way in helping you to achieve those goals. So um, a lot in store for you in terms of your learning, in terms of building professional relationships that are going to help strengthen uh, your overall approach uh, to VC decision making, a chance to earn a credential here from Columbia Business School. And all of this designed around the very best of what's out there in terms of online education. It used to be um, not that long ago, um, the online learning world was sort of massive open online courses that just conveyed information almost like reading a book would. Um, but now with digital transformation, universities more than ever before are looking to online technological solutions um, to help to strengthen and enhance what's possible in a traditional classroom environment. And that's what we have here, a chance for you to do just that, extend beyond the reach of what you can do in a classroom, give yourself that fully immersive learning experience where you learn as you go in a self-paced fashion around a schedule that works for you from the convenience of your own home, while also having access to the incredible wealth of knowledge housed within Columbia Business School executive education faculty, peers, and program leaders. So a lot in store here for you. We hope you'll join us. This is the last slide that we'll cover here today. Um, just helping to point you to next steps. Again, this is a six week program. Uh, we estimate four to six hours per week. So as you're looking ahead and you're looking to sort of carve out your schedule and make room for this program, uh, that's what you're looking to identify that four to six hours. Maybe it's your lunch break, um, Monday through Thursday. Maybe it's in the afternoons when the children are sleeping on the weekends, um, really carving out that time uh, to dedicate to this program across these weeks. Um, if you go over to the course website, uh, that is your next call to action, your next step. Um, you'll be able to do three things there on the course website. Firstly, download that course brochure. Um, you'll also be able to schedule a call with an advisor. Uh, you can schedule a one-on-one -on -one appointment using a one-click self-select um, app. It's at Calendly. You might be familiar with it that allows you to select a time that works in your time zone uh, to get connected with an advisor, really talk through some of the themes here. Uh, Columbia Business School offers um, many different online courses and your program advisor can help walk you through some of those courses, this course in particular, um, and ensure that it's the right fit for you. Um, and it can also help um, answer any questions you have that are logistical in nature. When does the program begin? Is there another run coming up? What is my alumni access? Are there continuing education credits? A lot of these sort of logistical or course policy questions, uh, your program advisor is gonna be closest to those details. Um, so they will be able to answer that for you. 
And certainly as you're looking to uh, finance your education, if you're looking to um, explore flexible payment options, special group enrollment pricing, uh, they can walk you through those opportunities as well. Uh, so be sure to go over to the course website. Again, you can download the full brochure. brochure. That's everything we've covered here today and more. It's a beautifully designed and comprehensive scope of this program. You can schedule that call with an advisor to really gain that sort of one-on-one -on -one mentorship. This is a free advising conversation that allows you to dive deeply into um, what it is that you're looking to do, uh, where you are in your learning, and whether or not this program is going to be the best next step for you. And of course, the third thing you can do is begin that application right there on the website. Uh, the deadline is uh, coming up just around the corner as uh, so you can get that application started as well. Um, so if you haven't done so already, um, open up the chat box. You'll see there's a link there over to the website where you can go ahead um, and take care of downloading the brochure, scheduling a call and getting that application going. Uh, so we hope you'll grab that out of the, the chat box before you say goodbye. You can also send an email uh, to Columbia at emeritus.org. That's in your chat as well. So if you'd like to get connected by um, email, we want to make sure you have the opportunity to do that as well. Um, Andy, I'd love to invite you back in. Um, as we close out our time here today, and we're thinking about uh, VC decision making online, um, any final words of wisdom or advice that you'd like to leave participants with here today? Uh, th thank you, Mary. And uh, like I said, uh, if you're looking at uh, doing any program or course on uh, venture capital investing, building a thesis and so on, I don't think there's any program that's out there that's better designed, better delivered, and better structured than this one. Um, would love to see participants uh, sign up for this program because I think this is a tremendous value add to your personal profile, to your personal ability to be part of the uh, finance and the venture capital space and uh, awesome professors, awesome cohort, and the learning experience is just uh, very, very uh, engaging and useful. So look forward to seeing folks uh, joining up on this program and being part of uh, this learning journey with them. Thank you so much again, Andy Savarman, for being here with us, taking us through this content and sharing your knowledge and your insights so openly and freely with us here today. Thank you again for joining. Um, and to all of you from around the globe who've joined in to be here, it's been an absolute honor learning shoulder to shoulder with each and every one of you. And we hope to see you back in the program beginning just around the corner. Um, for now, we sign off with a heartfelt Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good day. Thanks again for joining and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.